Hey everyone, my name is Ala Dewberry. I'm the Senior Program Manager for X Labs in the Office of the CTO of VMware. We're so excited to have you here for our panel discussion, the obligatory, obligatory culture discussion. Let me briefly introduce each of our fabulous panelists. First, we have Michael Cote, who is a developer advocate of VMware. His talk earlier was We Fear Change. Ashley Willis is joining us um, from Microsoft. She's a principal developer advocate there. And she gave a fabulous talk about burnout, how to recognize it, how to avoid it, and how to work through it. Heidi Waterhouse is a transformation advocate at LaunchDarkly, and she told us all the things about tech writing and the value of documentation in her talk, Dev Tech Doc Ops. Wesley Faulkner is a co-host at the Community Pulse, and his, his talk, The Scientific Method, The True Origin of DevOps, gave us a little bit of history about just the scientific method and scientific thinking over the past millennia or so. And Nate Shuda joins us as a developer advocate at VMware. So just a couple of housekeeping notes before we go ahead and get started. We do have a full hour, but we will end. <laughs> this is our Brady Bunch look. Uh, we will end uh, as appropriate given the, the flow of the discussion. And let me just quickly go over how to ask questions. So join us in the Slack channel in the sidebar that you see on your screen. If you uh, search uh, hashtag panel hyphen discussion and you hit enter, you should find us. Um, questions can be asked in Slack, um, so just go ahead and type your question in Slack. If you want to share your question live, please just indicate that uh, when you ask your question and we'll go ahead and bring you up on stage. Otherwise, just ask your question and it will appear to me and I will go ahead and read it off. Finally, if you want to join us for even more fun after this, stick around for the DevOps party games happening at 4.30 p.m. Eastern time or 1.30 p.m. Pacific time later on. Fabulous. All right, folks, let's get started with a couple of questions here. Um, in the modernization conversation, culture is mentioned a lot. What does that mean to you? Let me see some hands here. Wesley, go for it. I think culture is the adoption of new things, uh, continuously learning and adapting, being able to grow and to be able to see the landscape, understand what's coming and plan for that. Uh, there's also internal culture. So you not only need to talk to your team, but you need to talk outside your team, understand mm -hmm. what their needs are, understand how they choose to communicate. Sometimes people like a call, sometimes people like a meeting, sometimes they like strict documentation. So being able to adapt to your team to work in the most efficient way po possible. Um, and I have to say, I think diversity also is a big, strong um, growth for a team to be able to not only just go across different domains, but pulling both life experience and uh, company experiences. Sometimes uh, I've seen them work with people who I've worked with very large companies and they are used to a certain policy and procedure and a, uh, getting things done. And I've worked for very small companies where you just do it. You just push the production and just get it live. So being able to understand different perspectives, understand people who have used to different tools and being able to communicate with different styles and in, even across different regions, especially if you're a distributed remote team, that's all part of culture. And that's one of the cornerstones of being able to to really work with different size and different skill sets. I love that. That so much about adaptation and just like evolving and and looking at kind of who you're working with and that answer. I love it. Who else wants to jump in on that? Go ahead, Nate. So culture is one of those things that gets formed really early on in a corporation's existence. And it's pretty clear there are big differences between a three-person startup versus a 175-year-old financial services organization. And as unfun as it may be, we have to understand the culture of our organization because it is where good ideas go to die. And so you just have to get what your company is about and know how to work within that. You know, it's... I've, I've thought about this quite a bit, and, and I, I don't think, honestly, any technology project I've been a part of has ever failed because we made a bad technology choice. 
projects tend to fail because there's some kind of a cultural thing, some kind of a, a people thing that goes into this. You know, I, I wish all our problems were technology problems. I, I'm much more adept at solving those than the obligatory cultural ones, but we ignore that, frankly, at our own peril. Awesome. All righty. Moving on here to um, our second question that we've got um, from Emily Leahy. Uh, we often hear about DevOps being about technology and culture. For those of us who make products for DevOps users, how might we design for the cultural changes organizations need to make as well as providing the tech? It's a great follow on, I think, from our previous question. Go for it, Heidi. I think one of the things that's really useful, especially like I'm coming from a, a SaaS vendor, it's a small startup. It's really useful to either have on your team or really get to know people who have been working at enterprise scale and speed so that you understand what they're worried about. Because to them, we sound like a bunch of uh, wild-eyed yohos who want to do everything without a change management board and it seems extremely risky and extremely unsafe and they're not being resistant because they don't like new things they're being resistant because they've been taught that this is not a safe way to be and I think as we are learning to serve them we really need to understand their point of view and why they're coming at these things the way they are and it's very hard to do if you haven't ever worked in an environment like that. It's an excellent point about really tailoring that visibility to sort of the, the folks that you're working with. Anyone else on that? Anyone else got a take? <laughs> we'll go for it, Michael, and then we'll go to you, Wesley. Go for it, Michael. Yeah, I, yeah, I think, I think, you know, a, 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 you know, extremely related to that. Like, I think, um, if, if you're if you're making like let's just say devops tools or whatever uh you know in in most large organizations and medium-sized ones there's a lot of weird project management tools and ticket desks and just strange software that that uh most people don't encounter and so like having i mean from a technology standpoint of view like just being able to integrate with various things is great right it makes it a lot easier than just kind of hitting a wall of uh you know, when we go to the, the the project management office or the PMO or whatever people want to call it, like they use this whole set of stuff. And now we've got to uh, do some like, you know, manual person integration of this stuff. So a lot of the value that I see in tools like this comes from uh, we just integrate everything together uh, and kind of remove that that bottleneck of going from like talking with someone to like emailing them a spreadsheet to actually getting it in some tool where something can happen. Hmm. Wesley, you want to jump in on that as well? I was going to mention for the technology and organizational changes, I think the, the biggest blocker I've seen or the thing that's caused the most hiccup is the lack of transparency from different departments and from leadership. They say, everything's great. Everything's great. Everything's great. Oh, yeah, we had massive layoffs, and now you have to do twice as much work. Um, or uh, things are great. Things are great. And then, oh, we just landed this large account. Now we need to expand three times our capacity, what we, ha what we have right now. Um, and there are mechanisms for communicating that in a sensitive way to be uh, in a place where we can plan for that in the future. If, we, if, if leadership from the top is extremely transparent in the good times and the bad times, then we can plan accordingly. They may not understand how it affects everyone and everything with growth or scaling down, but uh, understanding who even is the point person for a specific department might change overnight, depending on how something goes. And so mm -hmm. transparency and accountability for making sure that the information gets to the right group in a timely manner, if that's built into the process, is something not only helps with organization, but making sure that we can stand up the right infrastructure or deploy the right tools in the right amount of time. 
That's a wonderful point. And, you know, I'm just based on the, the example of great, 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 oh, massive layoff, and now everyone's got twice as much work. I think that also does play a little bit into what Ashley was talking about earlier with, with burnout and, and making sure that, um, you know, management is prepared and equipped, um, not just with tools, but with um, various management techniques to, you know, really rigorously prioritize things and, oh, well, you know, our to-do list is 10 things long. Just, just take one thing and do it. Just do the most important thing. I don't know, Ashley, if you, if you have anything to add on that. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, I say over communicate to the point where you're sick of hearing yourself and communicate <laughs> in multiple different ways. I have a fully distributed team. So I communicate in person on team meetings in email on Teams, on Slack, wherever people are located, I am putting out the same mes messages over and over and over again. As soon as information hits me, it hits them where appropriate, obviously. So over communicating is key. Absolutely. Wonderful. So we've got another question here. Um, this is a little bit more uh, tactical, but I think it's an important one. Uh, what are some metrics people can track to monitor if their transformation, this this grand DevOps transformation is working or not. <laughs> it's a tricky one. Heidi, go for it. We have a report for that. <laughs> there are several reports, but uh, the Google Accelerate State of DevOps report, formerly known as Dora, uh, has a bunch of things that, that it uses as metrics for basically your DevOps transformation velocity. So it's talking about uh, mean time to recovery and time from inception to release. And it, there's, there's several metrics that help you see whether or not you're actually going faster. And faster isn't the only thing that we need to emphasize, but what we've learned is that if you go faster, a lot of your other metrics fall into place. Like, we are not entirely sure what's causal, but teams that go faster also tend to be more diverse. Is it because the team is more diverse and works together in a different way? Or is it because going faster doesn't work with a, a very uniform team? We haven't fully unpacked that yet, but we do know that they are correlated. That's super interesting. And I think one thing, you know, about going faster, it's it's learning faster it's you know time from inception to production it's how quickly can you learn and that's a fundamentally human problem which i just find endlessly fascinating here is you know we're at a tech conference talking about devops cool anyone else got any thoughts on that go for it michael yeah i i, I mean i think i think uh you know i in, in addition to measuring the uh, the the effects of things, um, like maybe uh, I, I guess there's a ENPS, like Employee Net Promoter Score, which is basically like, would you recommend to a friend or a loved one that you uh, you work here? Which seems like you know it's one thing to ask someone if they enjoy if they want to keep working somewhere because maybe you know they're lazy or they get paid well or whatever. But like, are you going to uh, subject? your uh, people you like to this job or not would you recommend it and you know i think i think that's another thing you can track to see if the way that you're changing the organization uh makes it a favorable place to work or not and, you know assuming that happy people is something you're uh you know searching for uh kind of again you know assuming that they uh, uh they contribute to those good effects uh the, you know that, that you want to achieve so yeah, I, I mean, I would kind of look for some metrics like that to figure out if people are uh, happy with what's going on. Excellent. Very good. All right. Looks like we've got another question up here. What are some what are the major roadblocks for businesses looking to embrace cloud native technologies? That's that's a doozy. Who wants to uh, tackle that one? <laughs> All right, I'll volunteer. Go for it, Nate. So, I mean, in my previous life, this was part of what I did, is how do you take an old standard enterprise and migrate to the cloud? And one of the things that, that I ran into on that was 
sort of the, the, the day in the life problem that for a lot of folks, change it sort of triggers the lizard part of the brain and it's like change bad and you're changing everything around me and that's scary because i was the expert on how we used to do it and now i'm basically right at the level of someone we just hired and that's very scary for me and it's it's so important to have conversations with people and to give them that opportunity to be heard and i was fairly successful by sitting down with people and just saying all right so so tell me what your day was like before and i'm going to map that to what your day looks like in the future and in a lot of cases we we're able to show how you know that thing you really hated doing it's gone now that toil is gone that's that's not a problem for you you get to do something way more interesting and way more you know something that's more important to the organization and higher value and and isn't as boring as what you had to do before and once you start showing them how it's going to improve their lives and that this isn't you know some kind of uh, thinly veiled way of of eliminating them or what they were good at I've seen folks turn from being your your biggest roadblocks to being some of your biggest advocates, but it's, it's so important to have that conversation and give them that opportunity to voice their concerns, their fears, and then work with them as opposed to just ordering them, well, this is what we're doing, get on board the train or we're running you over. That's a, that's a really lovely point. And just to like pause for a second, all of these answers are so, so rooted in just the wonderment of the human condition. And I think that a whole idea, Nate, of um, kind of shrinking the change and like, yeah, it's going to be different, but like, hey, at least this part is gone. And well, you didn't really like that very much, but hey, like this is, this is actually kind of not a big deal, I think can be a very effective way to just kind of get momentum going in the right direction. Awesome. Alrighty, so we've got it. We've got a big question here. Let's have a crack at it. There are a lot of enterprise software slash legal constraints around what we can or can't do on a team. However, the majority of the struggles I've seen over the years in consulting roles and prior positions is getting buy-in from higher managers to adopt slash support DevOps culture and prioritization of related tasks open parentheses, security related work, pri uh, prioritizing tech debt payoff, allowing and supporting tooling to support the DevOps team members, et cetera. Are there any tactics you've used beyond transparency and accountability of work, for example, to help get buy-in and support from upper management that has to juggle business goals and priorities against the internal team priorities and goals? <laughs> Go for it, Wesley. Um, just to, to dovetail off what was said before, um, being able to get buy-in is tantamount of making them feel like they're a part owner. So if you can say, this is the outcome we both want, this is the, the direction we both want to go, here are some options and here's, we can go fast or we can spend a lot of money. There's several ways to getting to where you want to go for either of these uh, check boxes that you want to knock off. Uh, we can hire a consultant, we can do it in house. We, there's several different ways of getting executives to understand what are the options and knowing that these are the things that you can be comfortable with. Here's the pros and cons and having them buy into that, you know, breaking it down to something that's really accessible to them when they choose, okay, well, we should do this and then we should do this and they help check off those boxes of these are the, the, for each of the steps to get to that endpoint, they can feel a little bit more bought in. And then describing, all right, if we do this, it's gonna take this amount of time and this amount of budget and the year the benefits we'll get out of that, uh, we'll, we'll have more compliance quicker so we can reach more markets, uh, we can reach more customers, or we can partner with different organizations based on these types of infrastructure allowances that we make because we'll have more flexibility. Being able to just open up the possibility, uh, it's one of those things where you just, you don't sell the hammer, you sell the house. You, you choose to say, not just the thing that we, not just the tool, but the outcomes that'll come from using that type of tool uh, has been a really good um, breakdown for me be able to get things bought in at a certain period of time. Um, and 
making sure that you're not the expert of all things. So they don't think that you're the person that's funneling information. So bringing case studies, bringing competitors, showing what other people have done and how they implement it and what they got from it. And so it's not just they feel like they have to trust you completely, but making, if you have this, this type of use cases where um, we can, as a company move forward and how other companies have moved forward and how, what their transformation was like and some of the accolades as well as some of the pitfalls that they know what they're buying into and also that you don't oversell something. So if it's going to cause some disruptions, it's going to cause some downtime, it's going to cause some headaches, it's better to know that up front and not hide it just to try to get your goals. Um, it's kind of like Amazon reviews. When something gets five stars, you're like, it's too perfect. But if it has three and a half, four stars, and you read the things where they say, well, it's it's too small and it's too big or it's too flimsy under these conditions, you understand all the caveats and you can realize, okay, well, that doesn't apply to me. That doesn't apply to me. Or I can mitigate it by using this other method. Even that complete picture we talked about transparency before is really key to being able to sell up. Excellent. Heidi, it looks like, yeah, go for it. I, I have a, a counterpoint. You're not wrong, Wes. That's, that's all a bunch of stuff to make it work. I would say that in all the studies we've done of DevOps transformation, change has to come both from the bottom and from the top. And if the top is not bought in, it is not going to work. Go get a new job. Everybody's hiring. I realize this seems kind of flip. But I also know that there's a ton of heartbreak and burnout from trying to make the right change happen in an environment that isn't ready for it yet. And if you feel like this would be the smart thing for someone to do and you can't get them to listen to you about it, you should stop breaking your heart and go work with somebody who has reached that point. That's where Michael's survey, the, the internal NPS score would be low. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's so funny, funny. Uh, Wesley, because I was just going to say, I think the metrics thing is so important to what everything that you and Heidi just said is even if you do your due diligence and you, you give leadership every opportunity to have an informed decision with a robust set of options for, oh, you know, it'll cause some disruption, but, you know, this transformation will, you know, have all this business value. Um, there does sort of come a point, though, that even with those brilliant metrics and everything, um, Heidi's totally right. I've, I've been in that situation. Sometimes it's just time to move on. And the higher mark is great right now. <laughs> really. Michael, did you have something to add? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, to, 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 to add on to all of those, I mean, there's, a, there's, there's kind of like that, um, uh, what would you call it? relaxing compromise sort of uh, trench to go in with this kind of thing. And I think, you know, one, one of the one of the reasons, uh, you know, executives, those, those those people up there who are not prioritizing things the way you want, like one of the reasons they, they don't want to do all this stuff is like because uh, it doesn't really make sense how it hooks up with what their priorities are, like what what they want the business to do. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, uh, I should probably go get the oil in my car changed, but until I really have to, I'm not going to go do it. Like that would be good maintenance to apply. Um, and I should probably also check out the tire pressure, all sorts of things I should do, but until like the tire blows up, I don't really actually fix it. Um, and so uh, like similarly, like you have to find that, you know, if you don't want to find a new job, which is always an option, I'm sure we all get great referral bonuses if you want to talk with us. Uh, but like, you know, you have to find some way of getting urgency for them. And I think something I've seen people do is if you're sort of uh, at the bottom level, you know, below these people that you want to prioritize things more, you kind of opportunistically wait until they need something. And obviously you try to be genuine instead of conniving, but you sort of connect what, whether you're modernizing or changing the way that you operate to, this is a capability we need for that. And just, I mean, as a quick example, right? Like a lot of people want to have like, what do they call it? Uh, 360 views of customers. You want to integrate together all this data so you have one view of a customer so that when you go from like, 
you know, 20 minutes into a call tree to someone else, you don't have to like reauthorize and re-explain everything that's been happening. And so if that's something that's important because it's affecting like, I don't know, revenue or conversion rate, you know, maybe you could say, oh, hey, uh, we need the capability to uh, like have a better customer, um, you know, a CRM system, a better customer database, which means we need to update it. Or like, you know, we need to have a new new type of whatever, it, whether it's some tech thing or capabilities, but kind of just wait around until there's actually an urgency. And you can, instead of saying, you know, hey, Cote, you should change the oil in your car, like I'm about to do, you're about to go on a big trip, a big road trip. You should probably change this because there's actually a reason to do it. Uh, but, you know, just kind of hunt out for those things. And I don't know, maybe like have long lunches until you uh, actually need to do that because, uh, the current state of things is fine, I guess. Love it. Oh, go for it, Ashley. So Cote brings up a good point. These are all people problems. You can't just go to your boss and say, yeah, I this huge transformation I want to do. This is going to cause a lot of problems for you. Your inbox is going to be filled with people who are upset about these changes. Uh, but it needs to be done, so good luck. Your boss is going to, why would I do that? Right, I already have problems. So you need to motivate your boss and applying that pressure strategically, like what they said is, is key. So does your, do you know what your boss's KPIs or OKs are, OKRs are? Look at those, what problems can you solve if you're going to create problems for them, right? If you don't know your boss, who knows your boss and can help tell you what motivates them? You need to know what motivates people in order to inspire them to work with you, especially if there is huge change that you're going to um, create. Love it. Jump right in, Wesley. Just, just wanted to dovetail off that. Also, um, if you're on a team, if you can get team consensus before you, you try to bring this up, that's also going to be key. If everyone is bought in and everyone understands the problem and you're able to have a well, full formed solution. Before you bring it up, that'll also help. But uh, also, if what Heidi said, you can just leave. I love it. So many, so many little opportunities for like that that lubrication. Whether it's Wesley, like you said, you know, getting early buy-in from sort of the the bottom layer, like your team and your peers, but also like understanding what is your boss motivated by, how are they measured. Um, you kind of have to, um, and like Heidi was saying earlier, you have to come from like the bottom, from the top, from the side, like you just, you got to work all those different angles. So yeah, it's, it's a big job, but it can be worth it. All right. Okay, folks. So it looks like we um, have gone through all of our questions. How about we end with just a little something before we scooch on over to uh, party games? How about just like a tidbit or two about culture and DevOps, this, this whole wonderful human mess? Let's, we can just go down the line and do it popcorn style. Kote, if you want to start, go for it. Just, just, just anything? All right. Just uh, anything. I'll, I'll, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, hmm. you know, I, 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 I've been wondering recently, like, uh, and this was mentioned a few times, but like I, I've uh, I've been wondering like were there ever like application developers in the DevOps world or were they like some other type of developers? Because uh, I, I I was catching up with one of my own old friends recently. My own friends. I'm sure he's friends of other people. Uh, but you know he's he's been in the application development area forever, and you know I'm sure he's like done stuff here and there. But he doesn't uh, I don't know consider himself to be doing DevOps. So I don't know if that's really like. Uh, uh, a, a little tidbit or just like a wispy notion, but uh, that's 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 the thing in the DevOps world I uh, idly think about every now and then is uh, wh what's up with these application developers? Are they just the beneficiaries or are they, they in here doing something? Very good. And it looks like folks are starting to pop off for uh, party games and um, as well. So very good. Heidi or, or Nate, anything, any closing thoughts to wrap up on after a very busy and wonderful day full of insights from you brilliant people? Uh, I think the thing that I would say about DevOps and culture is that it is a reaction to things that have gone before. It's a reaction to the idea of the aloof and uninterested developer and the cranky sysadmin. Um, and together, 
when we reacted to those, we built a culture that's very nice. Like the first thing I saw this morning was a bunch of hug ops messages. And I thought that was really revealing about the DevOps culture. Hug ops. I will need to follow up with you on that. That sounds very interesting. <laughs> awesome. Well, Nate, finish us off. Bye. Bye. Bye, Heidi. You know, I, I think this to me is just a recognition that software has become a more collaborative game. And this this myth of the lone wolf developer is is long, long gone as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, I see us moving more towards this. Let's judge us on what we deliver to production as opposed to getting so fixated on our individual metrics, you know, velocity or, or whatever you want to use these days or uptime. Because at the end of the day, our customers don't care about features and functionality to production. And so what do we got to do to make that happen? Excellent. Well, it looks like I may have lost sound, but Nate, thank you so much uh, for wrapping us up there. And folks, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for your participation. And of course, to our amazing panelists and all the wisdom that they've shared with us today. Uh, please do stick around with us to, uh, to go to party games and we will see you there. Thank you so much.